All right, hi. Um, let us start with some um, good old-fashioned generalizations. So, there is a very prominent strand in digital humanities, in text-based digital humanities, um, that focuses on the creation of textual or digital editions, as we like to call them. These meticulously curated and mostly manually annotated resources, often encoding following the guidelines of the Text Encoding Initiative, um, have emerged from the philological tradition as a theoretical and methodological framework for the critical analysis and interpretation of texts. This tradition emphasizes the importance of studying texts in their historical and cultural context, and the need to consider factors such as the transmission and history of a text, you know, provenance, uh, variations in manuscript witnesses, intertextual influences, etc. What's interesting to us is that these um, TI-encoded humanistic texts, or these boutique digital editions, which we love, we absolutely love, produce and want to see being produced in the future as well, they do not tend to be annotated linguistically. They are rarely lemmatized in the linguistic sense of the word lemma, because for those of you, if we have anybody working on text criticism, when they say lemma, they actually mean a token in the text that has different variant interpretations. So even there, on this very simple example, you see that linguists and philologists sometimes speak different languages. So these digital editions are often or rarely lemmatized. Um, they rarely in include information of part on part of speech, let alone syntactic relations. And this is, we would claim, both totally understandable and somewhat um, curious at the same time. Considering that there's a bunch of NLP tools out there that are making these kinds of, producing these kind of um, annotation, linguistic annotations, named entity recognition, etc., possible, and, it, and they do it automatically, right? So, why are so relatively few humanists using NLP tools? And this is probably the wrong audience because <laughs> like 99% 90, of you do, but trust me, let's not live in this bubble, okay? So there are many reasons, most important being perhaps that you know we are after all only human, there's only so many hours in the day. Academia also tends to produce specialists for absurdly limited areas of knowledge these days. And perhaps it's not the most obvious thing for a historian to think that linguistic annotation could actually help them analyze their source material. Um, and it wasn't also until recently all that obvious to NLP researchers that humanists actually produce and sometimes annotate high quality data that can be repurposed for training either better or more targeted NLP tools. Another reason is that NLP tools, uh, tools that can be applied automatically, often do not work um, or are not made to work with XML encoded text, which, is, <laughs> which some of us in DH you know, can't live without. And the, but also the kinds of texts that we work on are often very different from the kinds of texts that our NLP colleagues engage with. Also, the quality of NLP support varies from language to language. Uh, it makes a world of difference if you're studying, you know, political discourse of Europeanization in, in 20th century newspapers as opposed to r religious imagery in 18th century Serbian prose. Um, as David Baman and others have documented, the models trained on mo uh, newspapers texts are significantly less effective at reading, say, Shakespeare or, or Dante. Yet, um, most digital humani humanists currently lack the means to transform and adapt existing NLP models into useful research uh, instruments. And this is especially true for those who work with data sources in multiple or non-dominant languages, in time periods, domains, cultures, or scripts. But also, if we are being honest, uh, many humanists are extremely picky when it comes to automation, and they are very concerned about the level of errors that could be introduced with the application of NLP tools. Although I think being able to kind of manage your own expectations and learning to live with disappointment is a litmus test of adulthood, both for individuals, <laughs> both for individuals and disciplines as a whole, 
Um, I, think, I think there's something there that we should work on as a community. Um, I think we should be able to separate manual annotation from automatic annotation conceptually we got, without getting um, anxiety attacks about it. And finally, the, the black box machine learning models, models which are created directly from data by an algorithm, are, and for very good reasons, considered ethically suspect. And this is a big deal and a big question, not just for um, the humanities, this is for everywhere, you know, for li life at large. Um, these days in healthcare, criminal justice, banking, etc. So these are the issues that we are all grappling with. Yet despite all that, it's a, it should be a truth universally acknowledged that linguistically annotated text can vastly improve our understanding of and engagement with any kind of text, regardless of the genre or historical period in which, in which it was produced. Um, or the medium in, it, in, in which it was conceived. Um, NLP methods ask us to foreground language and contemplate how we as humans read text by having to explain our processes to machines. But perhaps most importantly, linguistic annotations can lead to better search and retrieval in digital editions, to more meaningful, semantically informed statistical data analysis, and overall better pattern recognition in textual collections produced both by individual researchers but also those in cultural heritage institutions, so digital libraries at large. And I have to tell you, every time I see a word cloud based on an English text, I commit the sin of envy because not all of us work with simple languages like English, you know, so morphologically, morphologically speaking, yeah. So, um, the question facing digital humanities is twofold, we think. What can we do to make NLP tools and assets better suited to humanists? And at the same time, how can, we, how can the humanistic perspective help overcome the kind of Anglo-centric uh, status quo of NLP more generally? So we address these uh, two questions through the pe pedagogical design of a series of workshops under the banner of the NEH Institute for Advanced Topics in DH, which we called New Languages for NLP, Building Linguistic Diversity in Digital Humanities. And when we put our call for proposals in January 21, we were really overwhelmed by the response. We received some 90 applications from scholars all over the world, working on fabulous projects, different languages, um, and it, it really was tough to make the, the selection. Um, ultimately, we selected 11 teams uh, that were working on languages as different as classical Arabic, Efik, Kanbun, Kannada, Old Chinese, 19th century literary Russian, Ottoman Turkish, Quechua, Tigrinya, Yiddish, and Yoruba. What did we do? We had a five-day workshop focused on annotation, a five-day workshop focused on model training, and a two-day symposium where each team presented their results. Throughout the 12 months of the project, all the teams met with the instructors monthly for two hours uh, for help sessions and to track progress. And due to the pandemic, most workshop sessions were held virtually, except for the final symposium in May 22, which was held on site in Princeton, and which was very much like this event, um, a pure celebration of embodied joy. You know, this was the first time people left after the COVID, so it was like being released from, you know, a cage. Um, our approach was based on the concept of humanistic NLP, which we defined as an area of applied translational research aimed at developing theories, tools, and processes that enable the meaningful use of NLP methods by humanities scholars in specific research scenarios. Um, to make humanistic NLP accessible to a diverse group of students with different methodological and technical backgrounds, we established four high-level principles of teaching humanistic NLP, which guided our pedagogical choices throughout the workshop. So what did we do? We highlighted the useful role that linguistics in general and corpus linguistics and NLP in particular can play as ancillary methods in computationally aided humanistic research. We focused on applied NLP workflows, corpus creation, annotation, model training, and evaluation, rather than machine learning theory as the primary learning objectives. 
we contextualized NLP workflows against the background of traditional humanistic practices. So we, you know, we de defined annotation as the cultural practice of textual enrichment. We showed how it relates to the practices of medieval glossing, concordancing, lexicography, etc. And we prioritized ethical data curation and management as a core component of humanistic engagement with NLP. And it was really, really hard work. Um, Nick will tell you a bit about the challenges and what we've learned along the way. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna talk about all the stuff that was hard, uh, which was most of everything. Um, <laughs> So I kind of uh, grouped the, the challenges that we faced into three sort of broad areas of challenges around labor, challenges around text, and challenges around tools. Uh, but before I get into that, um, who remembers this? <laughs> uh, kind of the, the, the foundational principle of this pyramid, right, is that yeah, you have these sets of needs, um, but a really important piece of this is that you can't meet the needs at the top until you meet the needs at the bottom. Um, so this is a linear hierarchy where you don't get to the good stuff unless you work through the hard stuff. And that's really how we found um, the, these sort of types of challenges to break down for our teams um, and with our problems. So really, uh, if I was going to redo this slide, I would do it like this, uh, because the bottom of this pyramid, surprise, is labor. It's not your text and it's not your tools. Um, so uh, what I'm going to kind of give you a brief overview of is that uh, basically, you know, the, the lowest layer made up of the most pressing and unavoidable class of challenges faced by um, our teams is problems of labor. Um, and you kind of can't help but be struck by the contrast between this and I think the discourse that characterizes NLP more broadly, where attention is really kind of overwhelmingly, although not exclusively, lavished on problems with tools, uh, like how well is your model doing and what things can you tweak to make it do better. Um, the reality we found is that researchers, especially humanists, uh, who are interested in engaging in NLP on so-called new language are gonna spend the greater part of their time trying to address what are really prior questions. Uh, how do you acquire annotators, texts, and a corpus of training data? Um, so shifting the focus away from the theory of machine learning and onto these workflow questions helped us address some of our challenges. Um, so labor challenges uh, for our researchers and our linguists on our teams. Um, so they face some, some challenges even before they joined us as teams. Um, I think engagement with NLP and the humanities is tempered by the overall level of support that is available to you when you are doing that and the likelihood that your institution will recognize that technique as a useful ancillary method for humanistic research at all. Um, for non-tenure track faculty and grad students in the humanities in particular, neither of those things are guaranteed. Uh, also, you know, if you're a researcher, you're gonna be asked to wear a lot of hats uh, to do this. You're going to be a software developer when you set up and configure an NLP library. You're going to be a linguist when you apply these formal taxonomies of grammar and syntax and make hard decisions. Um, and you're going to be a manager when you harmonize the potentially conflicting work of your annotators and get them to do the work that you need them to do. Um, and in most cases, the training that you need to learn to do all of these things is not at your institution. It has to come from somewhere else, and that's your job to figure out if it's available at all. Uh, so even in the world where strong support for all of these things exists, um, some of our participants uh, were not able to share their research openly because of traditional publishing imperatives. So if you have an impending dissertation or a monograph or other stuff, maybe you can't just put your data on GitHub for everyone else to use immediately. Um, so it's hard to get past these things. Um, but there's also challenges with labor around your annotators. Um, i.e. The, the people who generated the training data for the models. Uh, so for some of our languages um, like Yoruba and Efik, um, which are spoken now uh, in Africa, uh, the best annotators, uh, without a doubt, were native speakers living in the countries where the language is spoken. Um, but dispensing money from private universities in the United States to foreign nationals is hard to do, um, even when funds are specifically allocated for the purpose of doing this. Um, additionally, you know, you can have, of course, cultural or language barriers between the researchers and their teams of annotators, and that can impede research. Um, so one of our teams found that annotators uh, prioritize, like, completeness of the annotations over accuracy, just because there hadn't been a prior conversation about what the goals of the research were. Um, so that prompted an ensuing conversation about research methodology. Um, but of course, socioeconomic factors also play a role. Um, our annotation platform is delivered via a web interface, and some annotators have limited access to the internet, um, or it would have been really expensive for them to be spending a whole bunch of time doing this annotation for us um, because they didn't have access to flat rate internet providers or they were working on a mobile phone. Um, 
Uh, and then, of course, there's a category of languages for which no native speakers exist, including historical forms like classical Arabic and old Chinese. Um, and in that situation, of course, uh, we are back to here because uh, it, another hat that you get to wear is you're now the native speaker. Congratulations. Uh, uh, okay, so let's move one level up and talk about text challenges. Um, although labor was an omnipresent concern, most of our groups were able to progress at least to the stage of curating a corpus of training data. Um, when you get to this level of the pyramid, concerns about your texts are kind of paramount, so your first task is finding a corpus of machine-readable text. Um, and working in a new language kind of implies a certain level of difficulty at this stage, right? Because if, it, if there was a lot of stuff out there, probably there would be a model already. Um, so we kind of tried to head off potential issues with this by um, a selection process for our teams that asked people to come to us with a digitized or readily digitizable corpus before they started. Um, and that had varying levels of success. Um, even in the world where you have extant digital text that you think you're going to be able to use, sometimes things can change out from under you. Our Tigray language team had this corpus of text um, that was provided to them by another researcher that was working in the Horn of Africa, and they kind of found out during this uh, that the government that had mediated access to this text as the political situation evolved later said, nope, give that back. You can't be using it anymore. Uh, we don't want to send that to anyone else. Um, so sometimes the ground can kind of change under you. Um, Another obviously big question is, do you have access to enough text? Uh, so sometimes our NLP library reported that we were trying to train stuff with not a whole lot of uh, text or examples. A lot of teams had to revise their research questions and goals in response to a lack of text, um, transitioning to we're just going to do NER instead of whatever their more ambitious initial goals were. Uh, but sometimes small data sets are really desirable, like the team that was working on just uh, Russian and Dostoevsky novels. Um, and then the last question, of course, uh, is your text even digitized? So OCR is this great chicken and egg problem for new languages. How are you going to get good OCR if there's no model to do the OCR because you're making the model? Um, in that world, high quality images, OCR software, labor to correct the OCR, all problems that you have to deal with. Our Canada language team could not get a good enough OCR version of these like uh, inscriptions that form the text that was the basis of their corpus. Um, and then sometimes Unicode just doesn't cover your language because it's too old. Um, okay, uh, challenges with tools. Um, if you're making a, a model for a new language, you're already going against the grain. Most NLP libraries are really targeted to more towards business applications of like, I want to know if the reviews of my product are good or bad. Um, and my dev team of eight people is going to maintain the model after I build it. Um, if you're deviating from that pattern, it probably uh, means that you have a good understanding of the internals of this library, right? Uh, otherwise, good luck modifying it. Um, also, these tools, you know, as we've mentioned, replicate existing biases toward Western understand understandings of language. Uh, our teams that were annotating in right-to-left languages sometimes encountered unexpected behavior and really weird-looking displays when they were trying to do things. Um, for historical languages, concepts like word boundaries, sentence boundaries, paragraphs may not apply even though the tool expects that they will. Um, and lastly, humanists are often interested in what to an NLP developer would be sort of more of a fuzzy task. Um, so if your research isn't kind of neatly fitting into these categories of like named entities, POS, um, it's hard to figure out how or where to start or what you're going to sort of bend to your uh, use. Um, so we address some of these challenges by embracing free and open source software. Um, uh, one notable example that I'll call out is uh, the Inception annotation platform from TU Darmstadt, which was super helpful for us. Uh, but doing that obviously places more of a burden on you. There really aren't any humanist-oriented end-to-end solutions in the space. At some point, somebody's going to have to write code. Um, and when you have to work with closed source software, that could harm your replicability. Uh, we did try to work against that to help people host their stuff on GitHub. We tried to use established documentation practices like model cards. Um, how did we do? Uh, well, uh, we wanted to contribute annotated data and models for languages that didn't have them. We wanted to help people advance their research. We wanted to help them join the conversation around AI and NLP. And we also, as part of this institute, we wanted to create and openly publish a curriculum for helping people do all of this again. Uh, and of course, prove that this idea of humanistic NLP that Toma showed you is a valuable methodology. Um, so did we do this? Well, all but one of our teams created a corpus of machine-readable texts. Um, the amount of text varied significantly, which is probably not super surprising. Um, we do have annotated data for seven of our new languages with a median of about 28,500 tokens. Um, for context, I think the universal dependencies data across like 130 languages that's out there already has a median that's pretty similar of like 23,000 tokens. Um, work is ongoing. Some of it's still private for the reasons that I mentioned about people are still writing their dissertation or whatever, but much is on GitHub. We have four published models um, for Yoruba, Yiddish, and Kanbun, most of which do achieve greater than 90% accuracy for their particular task. Um, some of our participants founded a 
Daria Working Group for Multilingual DH, which is meeting after this. Um, all of us held a Spacey workshop at this DH conference, uh, and our instructional material is forthcoming via Daria Campus. Um, so our conclusions, uh, what did we learn? With sufficient training, humanists can engage in NLP for new languages. Our idea of humanistic NLP, we think, offers a persuasive alternative to uh, these kind of conventions around certainty and bias in mainstream NLP. Um, and we know that we can't rely on Google and Meta to meet our needs as researchers and humanists. Uh, so we think we opened up a space for people to take things into their own hands because while critique of the ways that those models don't meet our needs is valuable, empowering researchers to train their own model is always gonna be better. Um, What's left, we want to continue to champion the use of NLP methods as a fundamental contribution to the practices of textual enrichment in the context of traditional humanities. Uh, and we want to demonstrate the importance of annotated collections of humanistic texts as a foundation for training more diverse, newer, more targeted NLP models. Um, thanks. All of the people who did this are here, uh, in fact, in the front row. Um, so <laughs> we hang out in a gang. <laughs> You're welcome to come talk to us about any of this. Thanks so much.